we are in for a treat tonight. Um, so this is lesson eight on downside risk management. Um, and this was always intended to be a uh, virtual class meeting because we have a guest lecturer this evening, Dr. Stanley Kahn, who you may know from the textbook that we've been using, Do-It-Yourself Wealth Management. He is also co-founder of Ripsaw Wealth Tools, which we've been using as our software to uh, create and manage a hypothetical wealth portfolio. And this evening, he is going to uh, talk to you all about a specific topic that fits in nicely with the overall theme of this course, which is on lifetime wealth planning, and the use of technology in creating a lifetime wealth plan. And uh, he's going to talk more generally about the lifetime wealth planning process and how Ripsaw is used to facilitate that process. Uh, but specifically, he's going to focus on downside risk management, uh, an often overlooked aspect of the wealth management process um, and one of the underlying themes in our course and something that Ripsaw is unique in being able to quantify and codify into the wealth management process. So Dr. Khan has a bunch of experience both in academia and industry. Uh, so he has taught at University of Wisconsin, University of Chicago, NYU, University of Michigan, where he was the department chair, um, Duke. And then after retiring from academia, he spent uh, 15 years or so in industry managing institutional money for Smith, Breeden and Associates. And then after retiring from industry, decided that he wanted to start a fintech company. And that's what he's been spending his time on, building this product, Ripsaw Wealth Tools that we've been using. Um, so as I mentioned, he's going to focus on downside risk management. He will also talk about annuities, uh, which follows nicely from last week's lesson where we talk about insurance. And he's going to uh, show us how to create a DIY annuity. And uh, beyond that, he will also be doing some demos in Ripsaw uh, with respect to what we did two lessons ago when we talked about private assets and real estate. And so he will and this uh, would be good preparation for your next Ripsaw assignment, where you are going to incorporate private assets like restricted stock units and uh, employer granted stock options, as well as real estate investments or residential home or a vacation home with a mortgage attached to that. Um, so he's going to show you all in real time how to incorporate those types of products in your wealth portfolio. So there's a lot that we're going to cover tonight. We will also take questions. Uh, so I will be monitoring the chat box as well as looking at your smiling faces um, in the gallery to see if you have any questions. If it's a particularly relevant question, um, a pressing question, I will interrupt Dr. Khan, um, kind of play the role of moderator. Otherwise, um, we'll, uh, we'll save the questions for a stopping point. I, I hope that you all enjoy tonight's lesson. So Dr. Khan, I'm handing it over to you. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. I am just using this background to also tell you where the name Ripsaw came from. This is a ski run at Beaver Creek. It's a family favorite. And uh, a little bit of an analogy to say, when you get to go down a little bit this way, uh, all of a sudden there's a steep grade of moguls and you have to... Uh, plan how to get through it and uh, so there's some minor you know analogy to lifetime wealth planning and surviving is a good thing okay I, I like to talk about this in terms of innovation and disruption in the wealth management industry so this just i kind of fell into this um i had a pretty long academic career and actually, and in institutional investment management. And then I retired in, uh, and now it's uh, the end of 2013, actually. And uh, I guess my family and friends said, oh, Stan, now that you have time, can you help me with my investments? And I said, sure, I'm always willing to 
to help. And I took a look and I said, you know, this is much more complicated than you think. And in the current world we're in, being able to get information, to make good decisions, getting that information is somewhat new. So around 2016, I started to help people and I built spreadsheets as a way to uh, show all the risk dimensions and, and, and have a dashboard. Uh, and if you know investments, if you've done it before, the breakthrough, big breakthrough that came in the 70s when I was young, uh, was really that you don't think of the risk return characteristics of the security in isolation, but how they contribute to the total portfolio. And that's where correlation comes in, hedging strategies and so on and so forth. So I'm now focused on financial education, planning and wealth management innovation for individuals and families. And in that process, I felt, well, there's the education part. So I started writing things down and the book that you have for this course is what came out of all that and simultaneously building the software. And I was kind of very much aimed at you all as an age group. That is my kids were in their thirties and uh, two income families having kids. And they asked me how to do their investments in their IRAs and 401ks, et cetera. And you know, it was pretty quick to get 10 accounts for each family. Uh, multiple IRAs and uh, 401ks, as they switch jobs, you want to roll over that 401k to your own IRA, and so on and so forth. So it was a it looked like a big task. And one of the mistakes people generally do is they do the same thing in every account. Uh, that's very inefficient. And the other thing I found that uh, bothered me a lot was a lot of 401 camp uh, plans had very had really terrible options for investing, very high expenses and not particularly good performance. So I'm assessing the financial management service industry. And first I see a big knowledge gap between the client and the planner or advisor, which is also a way to create monopoly power on information. And you have a responsibility as an individual, even if you have an advisor to monitor them and make sure they're performing appropriately. Financial responsibilities, uh, fiduciary responsibilities is really important. The idea is you're supposed to act in the best interest of your client. And back then I noticed uh, in 2016, the yield curve was very low and very flat, um, a little bit increasing, but it was basically 0% at the short end and one and a half roughly at the long end. And the managers were charging, you know, anywhere from one and a half to 2% to manage that money. So by definition, they were losing money. The expenses exceeded the potential gains. So that bothered me. I said, these, these managers say, well, look, this is cash and very low risk assets. You should, you know, just let them have that themselves and you don't have to charge any fees. They can manage that. You don't need anybody to pay them to manage your cash. So that was surprising. Excess fees and expenses are a huge drag on wealth accumulation. Uh, you may have seen in the book, there's a table that looks at the average advisor fees and expense ratio of funds. It's around 1.68%. And if you look over 30 years, you're trying to plan a retirement, you're trying to invest, uh, you actually lose about a third of your whole wealth in just equities because of these fees. It's not just the 1.86% per month, but it's the 1.86% you could be reinvesting. So it's a compounding effect over time that is huge. There is a big literature on active managers and more than 90% underperform their benchmarks. So they're not adding any value. 
Um, when I looked at accounts of family members and others, friends that had advisors, the accounts would have, you know, 30, 40 securities in each account when some were inappropriate, many were overlapping, and it creates this opaqueness. So let's create, this is too complicated for you, says the manager, but here's what our research department recommends but it may not be a good fit. The next item that was bothering me an awful lot was what I saw and still see, it's commonplace. They wanna know how much risk you feel like you can take. So there are questionnaires and discussions and you know, can you lose 20% to the value, things like that. So they can put you in a bucket with stocks, bonds and cash that fit a particular bucket, okay? Let's say a common rule of thumb is 60% stock, 40% bonds when you're young, without saying what is the current market offering. Instead, they put you in that bucket, they give you a robo-advisor or an investment plan that matches that bucket, and they do that for hundreds of thousands of people. So it's a great model for them, this cookie cutter model, for investment portfolio. So they can manage everybody at once the same way in that bucket. Good for them, but not for you because you are generally going to have other assets they're not managing for you that, and liabilities that need to be part of the whole process. So that's what we call holistic. Managing all assets and liabilities, not those just those traded in an investment account but everything else you own. And also, shouldn't the asset owner have access to data tools and analytics? And that's part of what we're providing. Now, sometimes it seems like I'm very hard on the industry, right? And I've been in it for 50 years and it's a whole different world than it was in the 1970s, okay? The first index fund came out in 1976 for lower cost and just a very straight access to risk exposure of equity. Okay, so now in those days, by the way, I did my dissertation on investment performance of mutual fund managers, and I could only get data on 49 funds. Today with ETFs and mutual funds, et cetera, there are 20, 30, 40,000 different options. So that's another issue. How are you going to screen for what should be in your portfolio? So we've come a long way for having some low cost index fund availability. And actually last year, I believe it was, that the amount invested in index funds finally exceeded the amount in active funds. So that's been a trend that has finally uh, crossed the line. So I see still big gaps. Um, oh yeah, the hourly advice fee versus a percentage of fee of based on assets under management. It takes roughly the same amount of work. That's why they put you all in the same basket or bucket of funds. But yet, if you have more money, they can charge you more. And then there's this reluctance to say things like, well, uh, maybe you're, we don't need to manage your cash for you. You can do that on your own. And if you're charging an hourly rate, then you don't have any conflicts of interest when you're charging a percentage of assets under management, you have natural conflict. So the big gaps that still prevail and why we're in this activity is access to information, financial education, and analytic modeling that individuals don't have access to. That's part of the monopoly power of the big institutions, which is great for their economies of scale business model. That's good for them, but not necessarily in the best interests of their clients. Now, Part of what we're doing here is first, as the title of the book says, do it yourself, wealth management. But if we can also educate planners and advisors, and there's a collaborative tool here in Ripsaw with their client, and actually we do it at a much lower cost than what they currently do, um, there is plenty of room for reduction in fees and still actually even increase their margin. So that's kind of more in the future. So we view the critical next evolution is democratize access to financial data, 
have full account transparency green, and tools for consumer financial decisions. And that's what we want to provide. So trying to describe where our innovation is coming from, uh, this sort of blender approach looks good. User input, we have to know the client's demographics, their plans, their goals, details on their financial life. And from that, and their securities across all their accounts at once, which is the full wealth picture on the left, all account data. And what I found, especially with my children that are now older than I think everybody in the class, um, was, you know, if you have a profession that's not finance, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time gathering data and the labor intensive activity I was doing when I did stuff with spreadsheets. What you want to do is have access to automatic updating across all your accounts. And then we take this market data and match it with every security in your account to get all the risk dimensions. And then data is great, but how you use it is super important. So our analytics create an investment process that's disciplined and concise for you so you can spend time um, focused on making decisions and not the labor intensive activity. So I knew early on, okay, here's the book, but if I don't have a way for my kids and family and friends to be able to actually do this very efficiently, they're not gonna do it or they're gonna get lost. And I'm worried that they're not taking care of their financial responsibilities and doing uh, what's appropriate. Okay, so I'm going to just headline now the seven innovative solutions we've created here that I have not seen anywhere else. So please let me know if you've seen this level of activity. So the lifetime wealth planning tool, when I looked at, and I have it in the book, the list of things that define financial planning as a process, and they're the kind of things you would think of, you know, we're going to get all your goals and the plans and the budgeting and all those things together. Oh, then we'll pick an investment strategy for you. And then we'll deal with some insurance for you, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't know how you can do those things without understanding the investment environment that you're in today and what the market is offering you for an opportunity set. Okay. So Actually, one of those other early things that I looked at that uh, Professor Immerman mentioned uh, with regard to annuities. So annuities were very popular in the 80s. That's when they got their big role and sell, sell, sell. And people liked the idea that they could pay a price and have a guaranteed income for as long as they lived. Well, that sounds nice. Actually, that's what Social Security is. That's what pensions are. And you can purchase one if you don't have access to the others called an annuity. So you get a finite amount per month for the rest of your life. So I'm looking at the marketplace and say, well, how can I see if this makes sense? So I went online and I gave them my details and said, how much would it cost for me to get $2,500 a month for the rest of my life? And they say, we can do that for you for $520,000. I said, interesting. How do I know that's a good price? How do I know that this is better than any other alternative I could find out? Well, finance person says, let me price it, okay? So, what we do also in Ripsaw, we have a section for adding annuities and um, pensions and social security, et cetera. And most financial planners only put that and advisors only put that on your income statement. They don't know how to value it, okay? And they're afraid to because death is involved in other unpleasant things. So I said, let's just be objective about this. And based on your age, and we go to mortality tables and we say, given that you've made it to 65, as an example, what's your expected lifetime? And it's around 82 or three years, let's say. 
Now, of course, that's better than maybe 85. It's better than the, when you're born, the average expectation is around 78 or nine years right now. So, but given you made it all the way to 65, the conditional, conditional distribution is, okay, for all the people that made it to 65, how long do they live? And something near 85 is probably right, okay? So, what does annuity look like? It's a series of payments and they're the same, okay? And they end on death. Oh, what's your expected death date right. or lifespan? Well, we have that from the mortality table so we can take the present value, okay? Now, I find that's like 460,000. So why am I paying 520,000? And at the time the market had the long bond, as I told you, was about one and a half percent. And I know they charge inside you don't see it they quote you a price of five hundred and twenty thousand. you don't see the expenses how they come out and they were around 1.75 percent is typical okay so gee if the market's not even offering that how can this be great well one thing i did was figure out the internal rate of return it was only 0.61 percent i'm saying i can get two percent on a long treasury bond at this time why do I want to invest at 0.61%? Okay. So one is I'm not going to buy this annuity. And, you know, when I talk to folks that are in the business of selling it, what's their first response? It's, wait a second, you're not, I'm not, me, putting enough focus on the insurance part. That is, what if you live to 90 or 95? You're getting all those extra payments, okay? Okay. And then I turn around and say, you know what? I'm 65. And if I die two years later at 67, I've given away $520,000. And my heirs don't get it. So you have to think about the three parts of the probability distribution between now and my expected life, at my expected life, and then beyond. Well, if I can save a lot of money, do it for 460000 well, I can also extend either by using beyond treasury mortgages and corporates, or I'm also going to say, gee, am I as healthy as my cohort? Gee, if well, I just had all these heart problems, this and that, I'm 65, I ain't going to make it to 85, likely. So to me, it's more like, 75. Or if you're in great health relative to your peers, yeah, I'm going to make it to 90. So 95. I want to be prepared for that. So I can invest the five, 500,000, still save 20, and make it last until I'm in my 90s. So you need to be able to analyze what products you're being offered, break them apart, and say, how much of this I can do myself? Okay. And to say, how much can I do myself? I need to know what the market's offering, stocks, bonds, et cetera. Okay. So we built in a market analysis to see what and combine it with all your goals. When do you want to retire? How much do you want to receive after retirement? How much do you need to save to get there? And more importantly, at every point in time in the future, is a probability distribution you'll never hear okay, from advisors and plans. That is telling you if the 5% worst outcomes, what do they look like? Do I make it through retirement? And you'll see in a lot of cases, the answer is no. Okay? That's where you're seeing the downside risk. So you start out with what's called a normal distribution, but then you have a boundary condition on running out of money. So now you have an asymmetric distribution. And by changing all the parameters to fit what you think is realistic for you, then you can pick a risk return trade-off among the what's available in the marketplace that fits your investment objectives, okay? A complete wealth picture is you're actually in the holistic sense, you're managing net worth not just your investment portfolio. 
So now you want to include in your balance sheet all these additional items like your home, your mortgage, your credit card debt, all the loans you might take out, and all the assets, private businesses, employee stock options, all of these additional assets that you have. Now, I used to do this in my head all the time. That wasn't terribly hard. So like at Smith Breeden, I was a principal. So I was getting I had lots of stock and more and more as part of compensation. So of course, in my IRA and uh, 401ks and elsewhere, I had less stock there. Okay? So I'm controlling the risk of my whole portfolio, knowing, and I'm doing the same thing now with Ripsaw, okay? investing a lot, but it fits a certain stock profile that I need less of in my investment portfolio to come out with the right balance. So we show balance sheet then by account and holdings and transactions and all the different pictures you'd want to see. But the big deal is the wealth portfolio dashboard, number four here. So in the data gathering process, I told you we're going to bring down all this information about all your accounts, and then we're going to and all your private investments, right? And all your loans. And then we're going to match up the risk dimensions. Most of that will come from data sources we have of each security in each account. And some of it will be, you may have seen already, a manual accounts when there's, it's a non-traded asset, non-available, but you'll be putting in all those risk dimensions. And then you aggregate by risk dimension into this dashboard. That's your whole portfolio. Everything from individual accounts is contributing, but we want to make sure our whole portfolio has the right risk return dimensions. So this ultimate wealth aggregation we're talking about is a really big step forward in managing in a holistic sense. The second thing that happens, everything is measured against a unique benchmark that you picked out even not knowing it initially, when you went through your lifetime wealth planning, you were choosing among different expected return risk dimensions from an efficient tier of what the market is currently offering. That process created a benchmark for you. To do any kind of disciplined investment management, whether it's institutional or it's individual, you have to have a bet. It can't be zero. You can't tell me about your winners without telling me about your losers, okay? You can't say, gee, you know, I've had this stock for 15 years and I haven't lost money, zero, so it's okay. I didn't make any money, but I took on a lot of risk, okay? So you need a benchmark that gives you an efficient portfolio. Now, how do we get there? So the way we have to build the tools to do that is first have this ability to revise your portfolio change the investment weights, add new investment opportunities, place constraints on your holdings and transfer cash and securities between accounts. And what we do here is have in the dashboard, add a middle line. You may have seen this already if you've gone into revision mode. And when you make changes in individual accounts, the top row is your current account. The middle row is the effect of your revision. And the last row is your benchmark. So you may be trying to make trades to move towards your benchmark. And you can see it on the three lines and what all the sources of risk are. So what we call these 56 intuitive risk dimensions, okay? Now this optimizer is not the mean variance optimizer that you're used to seeing. This one says, gee, if I tried to do expected return standard deviation, and correlations with every security, all these non-traded assets I hold, I have no data and no way to know those. But I kind of do know all these intuitive risk dimensions. Okay? So in the bond category, is it a US or non-US bond? So that's my, and same thing with stocks, US, non-US to see my diversification effect. All right, is it in bonds? What do I want to know? Credit rating, okay, for my whole portfolio. But for each security, I have triple A, double A, single A, triple B, and then I've got below investment grade, double B, B, et cetera. And 
I have different securities that have different ratings, but what does my portfolio look like? That's the aggregation. And then what does the benchmark look like? And I want to move in every one of these risk dimensions. So in bonds, we also have buckets of maturity to give you levels of interest rate risk. And you've got it for your benchmark. And we have all the sectors. Is this mortgage agency, mortgage-backed securities, governments, corporates, et cetera. And for stocks, we have things like the U.S., non-U.S., value, blend, and growth, large cap, mid cap, small cap, and all the uh, sectors, you know, from technology to healthcare to whatever. So you can see the diversification that's in your benchmark, and you want to, at no cost, to get closer to that. These tools, five, six, and seven, are the productivity tools. Now, first did portfolio revisions, then I looked at that, and, you know, we had people using Ripsaw a few years ago, and they kind of, if you go, first of all, if you have five, ten accounts, the trial and error process is brutal. So what we did was build this optimizer that in one click minimizes the deviations, makes the trades that would minimize the deviations between the new portfolio you're creating, the revised portfolio, and your benchmark strategy with just one click. Fine. Then the next place people get stuck, gee, why am I not getting to a perfect portfolio here. And it's either going to be from things that are not in your portfolio that you need, nowhere in any of your accounts. I call this underinvestments. Okay. And you need to find them. And we have an enhanced screener to help you find it and then re optimize. But the assist tool, the beauty of that is saying it's going to analyze every optimization and see where are the underweights and provide a screener that can find what you need and let you put it in the accounts you want it in and perform an updated optimization. So there is an iterative process here that you have to go through because you're not gonna start out with a perfect portfolio and you may be missing opportunities. So let's just do, you know, I'm gonna do this live so I won't go through each of the pieces I just want to quickly show you what you may have seen already. The way the lifetime wealth planning starts out is you indicate what your current investment portfolio is, how much you're willing to save every year, and we convert everything to monthly. So we got the compounding and typically things like that come out of your paycheck to go in a 401k, et cetera. Uh, how much do you want to live on in retirement? When do you want retirement to begin? And you've answered some of these questions in the onboarding. And then what degree of risk aversion you have is represented by this downside risk probability. It opens up in rips on onboarding where it does five different examples from preservation to conservative to moderate, which is what this is, to growth and aggressive strategies, okay? Obviously more stock across the board, okay? In terms of uh, increasing those objectives. The, uh, in this example here, John saw, Jane saw they're gonna retire at 65. And based on how much they're saving, 20,000 and how much the market is offering for a moderate strategy, They've got the potential, here's what you'd expect to happen. And at retirement, they'd have 2,770,000. Their downside risk is, wow, there's the 5% worst outcomes have an expected value of 707,000. If I end up there, it's not looking too good going forward, trying to take 250,000 out. So this is a continuous process. If you start out well with your investments, you can stick with it or you will see, redo this, and you will see different strategies appear. If you're going downward, you will also make adjustments. And some of your adjustments can be, I'm gonna save more or I need a little less to live on, okay, in retirement, and plan for those things. And should I retire at 65 or 68, okay? You can change all those dimensions and given what the market's offering, and if you're, most of you are younger, you might, then certainly than I and Michael, but 
you could do 10% or 15% as your lowest probability. If you want to be really conservative, you do one in the drop down menu. There are these various options. But what you see here at the tail end in retirement is there is a good chance you're going to run out of money somewhere in your early 80s for the lowest 5% of outcomes. But even your expected wealth is dropping because you're taking out at a large rate, 250,000 a year. And even your upside potential is dropping as you keep taking out more money. So you have to be realistic in your plan. A lot of people say, oh, I wanna live on 500,000 a year, but I only have 300 now. And, you know, and what you will find as you move from moderate to growth to aggressive, you think, okay, here's my chance to make more money. But what happens is the efficient frontier has diminishing expected return per unit of risk. So as you go further out, your downside increases faster than your upside from increases in expected money. So that's why rules like 60-40, A, they don't work necessarily for your demographics and your plan. Notice portfolio end is zero in all categories. You know, not at 90, you're gonna run out. So it's very important to have a realistic view of what is feasible. And this usually gets people to say, you know what happens? I'm going from 20 to 40,000 savings. Let's see what happens. And you'll see the result. And then you have an analysis of the portfolio describing the risk of ruin and also some things you might want to do to improve your future probability distribution. When it comes to the market analysis, there are things in the market that provide you with information about the future based on all past information and all current policies okay, and technology and availability. You have to be careful about projecting the past into a future. That's where all these rules like 6040 come because they tested history and said, on average, this is what happens, but that's not telling you your downside risk. There are a few places that it gives us the market's view of the future, period. And those two places are VIX, which is the implied volatility from options on the S&P 500. So when we're in a crisis, you will see VIX skyrocket. Okay? I'll show you short, okay? some examples. And what does that mean? Well, one possibility is, okay, for people with great fear, they will sell stock and buy treasuries. So treasuries is the safe asset. They're bidding the price of that up and the yield down. Okay, so future opportunities at low risk are diminishing, but it's a vital up-to-date situation. Now, the reason why there's a recommendation for percentages in bonds and stocks is because bonds, most of the risk in them are, is interest rate risk for investment grade quality. Then mortgages have prepayment risk, corporates have credit risk, okay? And there are risk premiums for that. But long-term, any of those have huge amounts of interest rate risk. Now, what we've been going through in the last year or so is that the inflation factor, now the Fed, as you see inflation increase rapidly, the Fed is going to reduce the money supply by increasing yields and hopefully bring down demand and eventually inflation. This is not an easy process and it doesn't happen overnight. Everyone gets pretty excited that it's gonna end next week, okay? But it's not. It's built in by a lot of spending on a lot of folks' part and a lot of reduction in productivity. So we're having a poor productivity period now. So we don't expect to produce as much for the same risk. In fact, it costs us more. So the yield is lower. So between the treasury yield curve and VIX, we get a lot of information about the future path of interest rates. 
based on expected future inflation and some maturity premium and some real rate. What's kind of fun is when inflation, people start worrying about it heavily and they buy things like tips, treasury protected uh, issues, meaning that it's a good hedge against unanticipated inflation. So you get a small coupon and then you get adjustments in the future based on the outcome of CPI. Okay. Well, that sounds good. If everybody rushes to it, what do they do? They bid up the price. It's like insurance. And the current yield goes negative, meaning the real rate goes very negative. So now you're paying a lot for that hedge and your expected return totally is diminishing, right? So you have to pay attention to markets and what's going on in them. The other thing you should know, I think it's also talked about in the book about inflation is your consumption bundle, that's why I say we're all unique, is not the same as what the CPI index is. So what you want to do to hedge against inflation is things that you want to consume to get them purchased early. A house is a good example. Or what people are doing today, that makes a whole lot of sense to me. If you want to hedge against energy costs and you put those solar panels on the roof and you buy a Tesla, you're never going to pay for gas price increases and you're generating your own electricity to, so you don't have to worry about the utility company. Those are good hedges rather than the CPI, which is going to change dramatically also based on other supply demand conditions in various sectors. Here's the yield curve today. No, not today, I'm sorry. This, I, I did this slide November 17th, but you know, it's not very different from today. So you can see the yield uh, is peaking here at one year. And Notice as you go out further and further, you're getting more interest rate risk, but no compensation. Now, two years ago in here, okay, rates have gone up huge at the front end and the long term, okay, both, but more so at the front end, okay? So what we do here in Ripsaw is, oh, let's analyze them and say, you know, here's your incremental compensation for taking on more interest rate risk by going out to longer and longer maturities. And here's the sensitivity modified duration to those interest rate increases. We calculate a yield change in volatility and notice they're not too far apart, but the sensitivity is very different so that the return volatility is extremely high at the long end. So then we calculate a sharp ratio to say, okay, let's take the expected return of each of these issues, basically it's yield minus the one month and divide by these return volatilities. And we get a sharp ratio. So where's the sweet spot? It's really three to six month area. Now, if you go back two years ago, three years ago, it's really the same, okay? We've had, been in this low interest rate environment for a long time. Now, what people do that's unfortunate is say, they get a little greedy and say, oh yeah, I need more yields. I need more income. So they go and buy longer bonds with higher income as it was two years ago, okay? So they're out there 10, 20, 30 years, but the incremental compensation is pretty small and take on all that risk. So there's a difference in management between saying, okay, you're going to be 40% in bonds, and don't worry, we'll buy the whole bond market. And, you know, if interest rates go up, you'll have a loss, but hang on, they'll eventually come down. Well, that's not exactly what happens in the bond market. First of all, you don't know what future inflation is going to be like, and you don't know how long it's going to keep going up. But if my compensation is not sufficient to make me more than indifferent, then don't be greedy. Stay at that six month to a year range or even cash. Today looks just fine, okay? And see how the Fed policies work out. And so years now, I'd say, 
You know, anybody I know that has done bond management for their own personal portfolios, here's a difference, for their own personal portfolios, they've been at the short end for years. So they've avoided the 15 to 20 percent losses in 2022 as these rates went up. And right now, I'm still saying, you know, you still want to be at the short end. Now, it's different if you're 70 years old and say, you know what, I just need enough to live on for the next 20 years. And if I can lock in something near 4%, that may be fine as a good decision. But you don't know if inflation goes to 10, what you're going to be able to purchase for that four. So when you roll over short term, as inflation expectations increase, you get to roll over into the higher rates. The short rates will follow and should exceed expected inflation. The reason they don't always, as they hadn't in the last year or so, is because the Fed was uh, influencing the markets. I'm trying to be kind about it, okay? By sending out all that money and setting their own rates low, uh, not thinking uh, ahead enough in terms of the future economy, okay? so. We want to anticipate. The way we anticipate is keep analyzing what's the expected return per unit risk we're getting. And then we'll add correlations to it to see if there is further advantage to diversification. So here's what we provide as an analysis of governments and uh, other corporate bonds with credit risk, you know, and mortgage-backed securities with prepayment risk. And the model's kind of simple. What you do is you find out what is, you take that mortgage and you calculate its effective duration and you find a treasury that matches it. Okay? So that gives you the rate that's current market compensation for interest rate risk. And then you add the risk premium if it's for mortgages from prepayment risk, corporates from credit risk, and of course, High yield corporates have a lot more credit risk than does uh, investment grade. Okay, but look at the sharp ratios. They're all pretty poor. So the bond market as a whole is not looking good okay, as an investment strategy. So that 40% in bonds, got to think about that. Uh, rules of thumb are really dangerous. In the stock market, I said VIX is the first thing to look at. And here's a 15 year history. And, you know, we actually do go back to 08 and 09 where we had that big 82. And we also had a similar event during COVID. Well, what should we expect when risk increases? The market will demand a higher risk premium. And remember, when you're discounting any security, you've got expected cash flows in the numerator. And in the denominator, we've got treasuries plus a risk premium. So if treasuries are going up, that's bad for valuation. And that affects all securities. So this last year, uh, let's say 2022, was particularly bad okay, for bonds and stocks when they're supposed to you know, be negatively correlated. No way. They were not. They were positively correlated. You have to understand the environment you're working. Okay? So right now, at this point, I don't see the date quickly here, but um, VIX was 23.12. I think uh, today, I look, first thing I look at every morning is VIX and the yield curve, okay? So VIX was you know, kind of around 20, a little less. So 23 says, oh, great, I'm going to get more for stocks, but then how much more for each of these stock sectors I might invest in or individual securities? So you're used to the model, right? What's the riskless rate? Today's short-term treasury rate plus beta times the market risk premium. And the market risk premium short-term is a function of VIX. And so here you can say for short term periods, I want to take advantage of my position in the marketplace. Now, one thing you want to concentrate on, look at what was below the long term. I told you for many years, maybe a decade or so, 
Inch, the VIX was below. That means you're getting less compensation okay, and less risk. But if you think about different environments, I don't want to take a lot of risk when the compensation is low. I want to wait for the compensation to be high. And if it's VIX is a indicator of huge uncertainty for which the market's demanding a bigger risk premium by dropping prices, bidding prices down. Gee, this could be an opportunity because I was just in a low risk strategy. Now I can take some risk if I'm a long-term investor. If I'm trading daily, no way. Okay. Because I know most of what happens with VIX is a crisis that will resolve itself within a year. So I view it as a one-year thing, except, so I do trade VIX, okay? But that's only one of the dimensions, the risk premium. You still have treasury rates and you still have expected future cash flows for valuation. So you have to analyze the situation. So I kind of do back in, you know, 08, 09, we were in a financial crisis that would be resolved, okay? We had to have the right actions by government and business, et cetera, et cetera, and we did. And then we were in this low opportunity environment for a long period. So it was easy to take on risks for these spikes that occurred before. But when I looked at what's been going on the last year or so, I said, these higher numbers towards 35 and 40, I don't feel that these are going to be resolved anytime soon. This inflation cycle is long. So I would not trade that at all. So, but once we have VIX, we can compute. Now, up top, we said, okay, uh, here, the, um, what I'm calling um, the forward-looking market risk premium is 13.91 based on the VIX of 23.12. The long-term average is 17.2 in volatility, and the long-term risk premium is 7.7. Then you apply that to individual sectors and you get expected returns and you use the total volatility to get a sharp ratio at the end. Now, these look a whole lot better than the bond sector. So what you're gonna see pretty soon, I hope when I do the live demo and show you what the optimizer is doing within your lifetime wealth planning, it's gonna say, I don't want, you know, bonds. I will, I'm much better off in a barbell strategy between roughly cash or short-term governments and stocks. But for the same risk level, I get much higher expected return. This is kind of cute innovation I did. You can do correlations. The lower left triangle is the total correlation. But the other thing we observe, you know, this is street talk, okay? But it's, it's there, we see it, we observe it all the time. So during crisis periods, correlations get higher, much higher. So what is that telling you? It's saying, gee, this general market effect is dominating all the diversification you get by going across industries and securities. Okay? For their specific risks. It's all systematic risk. Okay? And so what we do is we divide up the two. And during periods when we have high volatility, okay, we're going to see that the non-market effect is much smaller and the market effect is much larger. And those are the two percentages on the right triangle that add up. Now you go into a low volatility period for the market as a whole. And then the diversification is great. All these correlations drop dramatically because the market as a whole is low volatility. And that lets the diversification benefits stand out. So you lose diversification in crisis periods and correlations go up. We know we get better diversification the lower the correlation. So we break it up and the equations are there in various places. Complete wealth picture is managing holistically. 
and adding all different investments you have that aren't in investment portfolios and traded. This is all new. The access to the risk dimensions of each security in each of those accounts, the first inkling we saw was 2017 and we started. Um, now we get it directly from Morningstar and directly from our other providers to give you, the user, all the risk information. So now you're getting those two pieces, okay, just by data availability, but it's our process and our modeling that gives you the final big benefit. Again, the wealth portfolio dashboard is a big deal of the aggregation, your portfolio, the benchmark, traffic light system, which you can set any way you want. So what we try to do throughout Ripsaw is we will draw on economic data and put numbers in but you always have the opportunity to change them to your view or preference. Well, portfolio revision part, if you've been in there yet, you see that middle row I told you about up here is saying right now it's the same as current because I haven't made any changes. And to the far right is all 56 risk dimensions, which you can pull up and move to the front with this go to column group easily, or go from on top descriptive information to just stocks or just bonds and so forth and components. So in revision mode, these first six columns are new. Okay. Back here, you have what your current holdings are. Okay. So we just moved those over and said, let's let you make changes in it. And if you change any one of these four columns to the right here, it will change all the numbers, okay? So there are easy ways to say, oh, I wanna sell this money market fund. I could put 0% or I could put zero at 150,000 and it will come out as a dollar change of minus 150. It'll go into non-allocated funds until you reinvest it, okay? So you have individual actions, add new investments, transfer securities, this is really important moving cash around because if you have a big savings account, which may earn 0.5% of it's got 50,000 in it, you wanna move it to a brokerage account where you can invest in a money market fund at 5%. But it can't do that for you unless it's available in that account. And you can see here, these were simple. These are just money markets, people getting started uh, there's going to be a lot of additions, add new investments. And if you're transferring, you want to sell all securities like a rollover IRA or something like that, you can either sell all the securities, move the cash or transfer securities uh, in kind and then make the decision later in the new account. Now, by the way, these are all things you want to experiment with before actually making the trades. Okay. This is more trial and error set up. That's when we developed the optimizer here that said, what we're gonna do is optimize the portfolio, right? This orange button is also a way to get it from the left menu. And what this is doing is first saying, gee, what are the differences, current deviations from your benchmark of each of the 56 risk exposures? and then try to optimize. Well, this did it and it said the reduction, uh, by the way, now you have a nice big uh, circle version of this, but I didn't make any progress, zero. Why did I make any progress? Because I only have money market funds in the two accounts. You've got to add new investment opportunities. And that's where this assist mode comes in, okay? So under assist, you'll be able to see what your portfolio is missing. It'll tell you and give you a way to add it, okay? And then you'll see with, to me, this third bullet point here is really important, but only you can do this, okay? So here's where robo advise all that stuff doesn't work, okay? Only you can get your tax efficiency is, it's called tax location or asset location. So if you have high dividend yield stocks or uh, high interest rate bonds, 
you want to put that in your IRA where it's not going to be taxed for many years. Okay? So you get the benefit of rolling it over and reinvestment and compounding without any tax. Things that are more capital gains oriented, that's what you want in your brokerage account. So we'll be able to manipulate what risk exposures or securities go in which, which account for better tax management. So when I told you 1.68 was a big drag on wealth accumulation for uh, fees and expenses, well, if you're missing out on a 10% benefit for uh, tax purposes, uh, that is huge. That's bigger than just the expenses in terms of a drag on your, your wealth accumulation. Okay, so here's what it's doing on the right-hand side here. It's saying, you're underweight stocks. In fact, you have none in your portfolio. You click on this and it'll find opportunities for you to add to your portfolio that are consistent with the benchmark and let you add it to your portfolio. In this case, uh, it's adding VTI, a total stock market fund, to both the brokerage and the IRA and reoptimize. Look what we got, 100%. The reason why we got 100% so quickly, perfect match, is because there are no bonds in the benchmark. It's cash and stock. Okay, so this is the perfectly diversified stock fund, including VTI and VXUS, the international one, which we added. And you see all the trades that are here necessary to get there. And look at the look at your dashboard. It looks like you got it to the penny, okay? Stocks, bonds, cash. But remember, if you go down the dimensions, value blend growth, everything, large, mid cap, et cetera. They're all matching the benchmark. So you do know that just cash bonds and stock percentages is not enough. A one stock, one bond portfolio is poorly diversified. So you have to have all the risk dimensions that define the composition of the sub portfolios of stocks and bonds to also be very efficient. And a disciplined investment process, by the way, I put this in the book. It's the end of most investment books these days. Um, it's the CFA Institute uses it. I've been using it since the early 80s. It was a book by Donald Tuttle. I want to give him credit, who was connected to the CFA. The CFA didn't do any of this back then, okay? But he did. And I use this to introduce what is forthcoming in the course on investments, okay? What are all the pieces from investor inputs to investment opportunities, why we're going to calculate each of those, and what optimization tools we're going to use and the proper way to do performance measurement on a risk-adjusted basis. And all of this stuff is feedback loops. So when I was at Smith Breeden, you know, they would tell me, gee, you know, the prepayment models in the in the ditch, so to speak, and not giving us good duration estimates, effective duration. So I built uh, an econometric model to do that uh, much better. And that was only generated by seeing that, gee, we were kind of losing money when rates went up, but we're supposed to be rate independent, okay? And that has something to do with spread directionality, but not for here. So, Ripsaw has all these elements of the investment process, discipline from inputs to um, opportunities to portfolio construction, monitoring and revision, and then the feedback loop on performance. These are the important things that we've added from a tool perspective to let you get where you want. And um, the last one was tax efficient tactical strategy. I think this is a good break time. So we'll do a live demo after the break. All right. So take it away. All right. Let me mention a few more things. I, I was talking about um, do-it-yourself annuities, but I don't think I got the full explanation of how they work in the book and how they will in a future edition of a Ripsaw. Um, but the intuition should be clear. What you're trying to do, if you've all heard about portfolio immunization, it's to say I've got a liability out there and I'm managing a portfolio to meet that liability. And it's a bond portfolio, but I need to eliminate interest rate risk, minimize it. Okay. 
So what you want to do is say, well, what is the interest rate risk of my liability? So you compute the duration of the liability and you create an asset structure that will match it through time. And so every, you know, sometimes it's done daily, sometimes monthly. If there's low volatility, you don't have to rebalance to the right duration too quickly. So the intuition behind a do-it-yourself annuity is let's calculate the duration of an annuity. And how does it change over time? So you got to start out with an annuity that you might think would last for 20 years. And initially that might have a duration of 12. Okay, just throwing out of that. Okay. But a year later, it's only 19 years to go. So it'll drop to 11 points. Okay. So your portfolio needs to keep matching that through time. Now, an easy way to think about it is, you know, the annuity duration is going to go towards zero at the end, okay? your last payment. Okay, then there's no more interest rate. And when you only have two months to go, it's very little. Right? So you're going from a high level down to a low level. So if you think about investing in three treasury funds, short term, money market fund, if you like, an intermediate term, and a long-term fund. So with those three durations, you do the weighted average that matches each future date of your liability, the actual annuity in the portfolio you're managing. So you can imagine it's kind of easy because if your duration is lowering, the money I need to take out this month, I'll take it out of the longest, the long-term fund, right? because then I'll be lowering my duration to match the next one. But we do the explicit calculations. And then we wanna manage all interest rate risk, which includes, you know, the, but I, when you just use duration, you're managing level interest rate, all rates go up or all rates go down. But if short rates go down faster than long rates, you got a steepening of the curve. If they go up and the other goes down, you've got an invert going on. So you have what's called key rates at various points of the curve, one year, two year, three year, et cetera, all the way out. And so you manage the key rates to be the same, and then you're hedging all possible interest rate exposures. So if you thought of a spreadsheet, you just have the three columns for the three funds and your matching duration, and it tells you where to move the money as well as how to take it out for your annuity. Okay. It's not real, it sounds a little, you know, computational, but it's really simple. You can do it on a spreadsheet. But we'll we'll put it in. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is option strategies. So to me, like my first, when I was your age <laughs> and I took a course in options and I realized that was just cool to me that I could actually change the probability distribution of outcomes of a stock with options on the stock. So, the, most, the clearest one is a protective put strategy. So it means you buy a put option that lets you sell at a price, let's say a little out of the money. So um, if the current stock is at 100 and you say the most I want to lose is 20% down to 80. So I buy an option to sell at 80, okay? So as the stock price goes down, it's not worth anything to exercise. It still has value because before the exercise date, it might still go down below 80. But I'm not going to exercise it until it goes to 70 or whatever. Okay. And say, that's my map. So I'll have the gain to offset anything below 80. So you've changed the probability distribution to have a tail all the way down to zero to I can only, I've limited my losses to eight. 
but I paid for it in the option, the put option, okay? Now you have to think about, is the price too high for that insurance? Or is it a good price for me to do it? In fact, maybe it'll be even a low price. What does option prices depend on? The only thing that's not observable that we can imply by today's price is volatility. So if the implied volatility is higher than kind of long-term average, if you want to think of it that way, then I'll be paying a high price. If it's low, oh, this is great. This is cheap insurance, right? The downside. Now, in practice, what professionals do is say, it kind of is an almost an axiom, right? Uh, because there's this special additional insurance in there that implied volatilities tend to be a little upward biased in terms of ex post actual volatility. So you can do synthetic replications of a protective put. Think of it this way. If I'm owning this stock and it starts to go down, well, the value of the put's going up, but my equivalent to that is sell some stock and put it in cash. So as you go down, by the time you reach the stock price of 80, you're all in cash. So as all you're doing is replicating the path that a protective put would do with a cash stock replication. But you have to, you can't go on vacation, okay? If you're gonna do that replication because you're trading every day. You can go on vacation if you buy the protective put and know you're, 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 you're fine, no matter what happens in the marketplace. So what traders do in managing a portfolio for downside risk, if options are too high a price, they do the synthetic, okay? And if ex post volatility is lower, and the way that works is you pay as you go, depending on volatility. So if volatility ex post is exactly equal to what it was ex ante, then you'll pay the same price for the premium. You just won't see it up front. Okay. So the choice between replication and doing buying the put is what is current market volatility compared to what you forecast it to be. Okay. But this unique idea of changing the probability distribution that the worst outcome is 80, and it's an out of the money option, which makes it a little less expensive. You could pick, I don't wanna go below 90 or 70, and there are different prices for those options. The closer it is to 100, the more you're gonna pay for. So once you understand option pricing and understanding their options are really volatility bets, and the fact that most fixed, in, fixed income securities other than treasuries have prepayment options or credit risk options and so forth, you can see the, the value of them. And that's part of what determines the risk premium for that type of risk. So this is our website, if you haven't seen it before. And those slides I showed you were from earlier dates. This is today, okay? So 18.61 is VIX today. And it's really only a little bit above the long-term 17.2 okay, for market volatility. So actually this volatility as it dropped down, as I told you earlier, I didn't think this period was a time in which you could play VIX because it was more, now Now that it's come down and the S&P 500 is still about 15% below it was a year ago, okay? It means whatever we got out of reducing that uncertainty is gone and we still have a big loss, which means it came from treasuries increasing in yields and the discounting and from expected future cash flows being lower with an impending recession. So that's what the market, how it's doing. So you always have to look at the basic valuation equation and try and interpret the market evidence to valuation.
the help menu. So we have a set of tutorials that are useful. There's the onboarding process that maybe some of you have already gone through. And I'm going to jump right to the end of that, so to speak, uh, for this case. So there's good places for help. And uh, we also have another way to get to markets right here. Go back to the balance sheet. So let's see the accounts that loaded. I have a brokerage account here, an IRA, 109,117. That price has changed during the day. So every time you enter, if you if you go into Ripsaw during the day, it's going to update with today's the current market prices. Anything that's been trading during the day, you'll have the latest price. Okay, so this I'm keeping this simple so I don't have too many numbers. So I'm going to keep the accounts limited uh, to start with a brokerage account and an IRA. So we've got the question of, you know, which is the better location for tax purposes for certain investment. Got a Model Y here and a, and a home and uh, credit card information and home mortgage. Uh, you'll see there's something here called transactions. So it will, if you've got all your credit cards in and all your, your bank accounts, checking accounts where direct deposits are made and everything else you can do the kind of budgeting stuff you might think of. And as I said, we have all those risk dimensions loaded as well, and everything is aggregated up to the wealth portfolio dashboard. So I want to take a few minutes to look at that. And this is just what we call descriptive information here. So with 56 risk exposures and a few other things, um, we you can't look at it all at once it's just too much data so you'll see i we can give you some different ways of looking at it quickly all right so um net worth now notice look we have net worth on the balance sheet at eight hundred ninety-five thousand. we have net worth in market value terms of a million one thirty-five gee why are they different we'll answer that shortly and when I'm looking at net worth, it's assets minus liabilities, but up here it's in market value terms. It's also keeping track one day returns. What did your portfolio do versus what did the benchmark do? And here the account just lost $142 relative to the benchmark, not a big number. Here's something interesting, real estate. Now, when I first started doing this in spreadsheets, it made it a lot easier for people, especially the now anywhere from 30 to 60 years old. Um, they tended to have a house at some point. And notice the house is 124% of your portfolio. Gee, how do you get more than 100%? Well, you have a mortgage, so you're borrowing and levering up. Okay, So notice bonds are minus 505. Gee, why is that? It means your mortgage is a short position in bonds. It benefits when rates go up, okay? While all other bonds lose money when rates go up. And when rates go down, your mortgage is not doing as well, but you have the prepayment option to use, okay? So that's a big benefit there. So uh, in other words, you're holding on to a high interest rate mortgage when current market rates are lower. So that's bad. So it moves in the opposite direction. It's a short position relative to rates moving. Okay, so your net minus 505, meaning your mortgage is higher than your bond investments in these portfolios and your other assets. Stocks, okay, 223 are higher. So notice the red indicator. You can here set what levels you want. These are currently set at um, red is like more than a 4% difference. Yellow is two and uh, less than two is green. Okay, so gee, my bonds are not far off. Okay. And my, my cash is way low. Okay. So it's kind of like saying, I'm going to probably need to sell some stock and buy some cash. Okay. Might not have much to do with the bonds. Notice my yield, which includes the mortgage, is negative. Okay. 
here's my expenses relative to my benchmark means I'm doing very well in low cost tasks. So one thing we have here is called, this is net worth mode. When we click on that, we get investment mode. So now we're taking out all your real assets like homes, cars, et cetera. And we're focusing on your investment portfolio and any associated liabilities. Now you have a choice when you're setting up to make the mortgage an associated liability. So people like to think of the mortgage attached to the house and take it out when I'm looking at my investment portfolio. And notice now the bonds are positive. Okay? So the mortgage was higher, but we had a few bonds in here, not much. Okay, so in here, we're also from our benchmark strategy. Okay, notice the saws, um, Jane and John saw, picked a strategy between that's, you know, mostly moderate, but 20% conservative, 80% moderate, to get comfortable with their future portfolio potential outcomes in retirement and for saving. So as they went through the process, they had a lower savings amount and a higher uh, withdrawal uh, objective at the end. And they found a settlement point that said downside risk, I'm gonna get through. I may not have a lot to give you know, in the worst possible case to uh, my heirs, but I'm getting through. And I'm expecting to have 2.4 million for it. But I'm also expecting to have 3.14 million when I retire. Okay, so, but if I use that right, stay on this course, I'll be fine. I might want to change at that time. And you can go through this process then as well. If I end up with just a million for the downside risk, I might want to change my strategy from that point on. Or I might be on this red line somewhere earlier and make a change or any of these. If I did really well, I might want to lock it in. Okay. Kind of interesting when I talked about fiduciary responsibilities and institutional management, like let's take um, a pension plan, uh, it could be public, private, whatever. They have employees that are going to get their retirement future retirement income. And they have to decide what strategy to use to match that liability structure, what assets to buy, stocks, bonds, alternatives, everything else. And I've been in these situations where the market had a great year. And what they determine every year is, are we on course or are we underfunded and we have to add more capital? Or am I overfunded and I'm in good shape? I can then contribute less potentially in the next year or so. And I was always bothered by the fact that when they got overfunded, they wouldn't go into a strategy to manage downside risk to never be underfunded again, which you can do. The reason they wouldn't do that is these are big operations. They have a bunch of analysts, they, they do some internal management, they hire other companies like Smith Breeden to manage sectors for them from the outside. So their jobs are so important to be able to manage all that stuff that they don't wanna effectively buy insurance. And then when they're evaluated, why are you buying insurance? Okay, when you're supposed to be so good at this, okay? And, make life easier for us in the future. Well, we've gone through these down markets like we've had in the last year and a half or so, and a lot of pension funds are now underfunded again. You should, once you get way overfunded, you should never end up down below fully funded again. But that's a question of fiduciary responsibility versus the way the industry is set up and works. Sorry for the direct question, but it, Felt right. <laughs> um, so here, in not just those five choices of, um, we went from aggressive growth, moderate, lower, lower was uh, 
conservative and then preservation is very low risk. You can pick any point of the hundred along the frontier and be in between. And this is the one that Jane and John saw felt comfortable with. And in that process, they revealed a point on the efficient frontier. Now, this is an interesting efficient frontier because it's today. What is the market offering today? And if you just kind of look over here, the solution was the barbell. I told you this was coming. Cash and stock, no bonds. Why no bonds? Well, the expected return on cash is actually higher than bonds, okay? Because bonds include all the long-term stuff and the yield curve is declining. And notice the risk, okay? Only 0.3% in cash, but four and a half. So why would you want the bonds unless they served a great diversification purpose like having strong negative correlation with your stocks? But the correlation today with stocks and bonds is very low. Stocks and bonds here, 0.352. It's not negative. It's not a great diversifier. But its return contribution is so low that the optimization says, we're not doing any bonds. We're gonna do cash and cash has a few short-term bonds in it, fine. And so that's your benchmark now, okay? And then we go out and get the 56 risk dimensions of that portfolio to match against your portfolio and your revision decisions okay, to come to a good conclusion. Okay, so look how low this bonds is in terms of expected return and risk. Now, usually there's some, now, when I did this a few years ago, yes, bonds were in, okay? But they're not today, okay? So you have to deal with today's environment for your future. And we have both a long-term and short-term for the tactical trades you might wanna do in short-term. And when you pick your benchmark, here we saw it was, 53% BMFXX, no bond, BND, BTI, 36, and 9.3 for VXUS, the international stock fund. But then you go into each fund and you say what, how much cash, bonds, and stocks are in each fund. And VMXX has a big amount of cash, but it also has some bonds that are over a year. So they fall into the bond category, even though they're very short term. And even VTI has some cash and VXUS has some cash. So the total is 45.17 cash, not 53.86, even though we use this money market fund, because we have a little bit of bond in there and stock. Your current portfolio is only 1.47 cash, 0.17 bonds and 98% stock. So we got some work to do, right? Okay, but that's where all this is coming from. And they choose a good news point in terms of being able to have enough left to manage their retirement. But you can do all combinations of this and the risk dimensions through here. So simultaneously, you find what is your preferred lifetime consumption investment decision, basically. Okay, so we've done that already. We've got the benchmark and go back to the balance sheet. We could also look by account okay, and then open each one up and see what's in there and then get all its risk dimensions. And you can group by holdings if you like. That's usually it. So we're taking if something like uh, Tesla, I think it's in more than one account. Yes, it's in the brokerage account and the IRA account. Okay, tells you a little bit about Tesla, if you're interested. But where we put it matters also. Okay? And I told you about the transactions already. Now, let me go back to the balance sheet a second. Back to net worth mode, right? where we had this minus 505 
these negatives, and also a net worth of a million one thirty five. Well, let's, if you click on any of these, you move into account mode. So why the difference in net worths? The only place we could have it is we have the book value, okay? So let's look at the home mortgage. We set it up as a manual account. And what we did when we were setting it up was put in the origination date. Here it was January 1st, 2020. It was a 360 month, 30 year fixed rate mortgage for $800,000. Now, since then it's been a couple of years or so and the outstanding balance is down to 745. We wanna know, gee, what's the value of that from the perspective of the user here? In this case, um, John and Jane saw. Now, the way we do the valuation is say, gee, I got that loan three years ago at 3%. The current market rate for a 30 year fixed rate is 6.656. So sometimes I have folks that will uh, call me that are retired, talk family, friends, whatever, and say, you know, I really want to get rid of my mortgage. So I said, well, first tell me what's your mortgage rate. Oh, I got it three years ago when I moved out here to Colorado and I got a 3%. And I'm saying, you don't want to pay that down. Because instead of paying that down, you know, as a prepayment, you know, pay it off. Because I have money in my other um, investment accounts to pay it down. Okay. But gee, at 3%, I can invest that money that I would use to pay down, I could have put it risk-free in a uh, money market fund at 5% now. So I'm making two, I'm paying three and investing at two, I have five. So I'm making a 2% spread. Now, if you invested in another person's mortgage, so to speak, through a mortgage pool, you'd be getting the 6.65. The present value of the difference takes you down to really equivalently owing 505,000, not 745. Under these market conditions, you'd much rather not prepay and invest, and you will have that benefit, that spread of over 3%, 3.65%. So that's like owing only 505 instead of 745. So that's about, $240,000 difference. And if you look at the difference, if I go back on balance sheet, you'll see the 1,135,000 minus 895 is about $240,000. So you keep that low rate mortgage and that's called a lock-in effect. You're gonna say, gee, that thing's worth 200. I'm not moving anytime soon unless some fantastic offer happens. Okay, okay. so we can also go into account mode by clicking on any one of these and expanding just to see what's in the accounts. Okay. Well, when I do look over accounts, I say, yeah, wow, some individual securities, that's not great diversification. Oh, there's a growth tilt here. Money market, total stock market. You know, you have, oh, Vanguard value. So you've got value and growth, okay? matters how much you have in each. If you had equal amounts, you would roughly end up with a blend, okay? In terms of value blend and growth. And actually, if you read chapter four, the um, example I gave there for somebody that uh, asked me for advice and I analyzed the portfolio, when it came to picking, a, creating a new portfolio, there, gee, I noticed, well, What's the yield on growth? It's 0.69. What's the yield on value? 2.47. So what would you want to do if the total together, those two are really large cap blend together or like the S&P 500 almost, okay? But if I separate it into these two, 
groups and then put the right weights on it and put the value fund in the IRA and the growth fund in my taxable brokerage account, then I'm going to save a whole lot of money on taxes. So you want to look for these combinations uh, when they're valuable. And in the IRA account, also they have a nice mixture of funds. Actually, they're almost the same, except this one has total international and the other doesn't. And the other has the growth fund and this one doesn't. So it's got some value in here, that's good, but all of it should be if you were doing the total. So kind of next step is to say, gee, I'm off, look at my cash versus where I should be and stocks. And, but I'm keeping my house and mortgage. So, you know, I'm probably I'm gonna, I'm, this is gonna happen automatically. It's gonna, if I wanna go into a new revision, it's gonna go into investment mode and take out any real assets and associated liability. And what it also does is this middle area I told you about that right now matches current, but you wanna move it towards uh, the benchmark and get rid of these reds and make them all green. Okay. And what also pops up is this solid blue line vertical to the left of it is six new columns. And this is where you can start making changes if you want, okay? So if I wanted to, and I'll do it in the, I'll do it here. What do I have? I have a money market fund. Well, it's very little in there. Um, let's go here. What do I need to do? I need to increase my cash, right? And reduce my stock. So if arbitrarily I say, well, oh, let's get rid of the value fund. I could put a zero on that, okay, for ending value, meaning I'm selling it all. And you know what? I need some more cash, so I'll put 17,094.76 in it, okay? So what have I done? Up here, notice I've lowered my stocks towards my goal of the benchmark. And I've increased cash, but I'm still far away. And I still don't want to do that, do all this by hand. So that's why we invented the optimizer. So when we click the optimizer, we go right to 99.32%. Oh, everything is green, okay? And the analysis with assist says no significantly underweight risk exposure. Now, the reason why that works so well is because there were really very little in bonds here and I didn't want them anyhow in any of these accounts. And I had nice, large diversified stock options and um, international as well as domestic total stock market. Okay. In the other account, I had uh, total international. Now notice what it did. It sold Disney and Tesla in both of these accounts because that's just reducing diversification with no apparent benefit, okay? If you have no special information. And notice, oh, up here, we're very close within pennies to stock bonds cash, but also in looking at the optimizer, 99.932, the only reason it's not 100 like it was in that earlier example is because in the benchmark, I use ETFs and the very slight difference here, it's all mutual funds because that's what the IRA account allowed and the person John saw, or maybe it was Jane in this one, was working for a company that had the 401k and they monitor because it was an investment company. They only want them to trade mutual funds and not uh, ETFs. But if we go down the list here, all the bond characteristics for risk dimensions and credit quality, maturity, international, everything matches and all the sectors match. These are the two columns 
minimize deviations in percent and dollars. So you can see we went all through it and got to 100 percent. And we went from having a 312,000 standard deviation to 214 trivial uh, for this. And the next question is, OK, I got there. What do I have for tax purposes? Do I have the right things? Well, look at this. Why do I want in my brokerage account all this taxable interest from the money market fund? The money market fund is yielding 5.05%, okay? So how would I get rid of that? Well, I need some in the brokerage account for cash, emergency, whatever. So let me just say I'm gonna take it down to $20,000, which means I have 49,000 non-allocated now because I sold. Um, and if I, I don't have to make a decision where to buy because what I wanna do now is say, for the money market fund, I'm gonna put a hold on it, which means if I want more than 20,000, it's gonna to have to be invested in the IRA where I want it. At the same time, we'll take advantage of other things. So I've lost, I've gone from 99 to 97.7, but I could find this worthwhile for tax purposes, okay? To lose that 2%. And nothing major is read except the US non-US now. There's a little, and that's the cost, okay? But if I go to add investments, oh, it says I should add a non-US stock investment, okay? If I go down here, notice it picked options for me. Now, you can reduce in the screen. The problem is if you do a total screen, you get 10,000 opportunities, okay? But here I'm working in Vanguard, so I'll reduce that. I can make that all if I want, all potential funds. I can also say, you know, I'm not gonna pay more than 0.5, half a percent expense ratio. I could also say, I only want an index fund here. I don't want active, okay. And you know what, I might even, well, I'll leave both mutual funds and ETFs. Apply the settings and my choices get further limited, uh, which is easier to deal with. Oh, VXUS, I know that's in my benchmark. So why don't I just add that? And I'm gonna put it, First in both accounts, add and re-optimize. And I'm back to 99.932. So when I did that at first, there were an infinite number of combinations between the two accounts that I could get there. But now I've got it in a way that I'm in a better tax position. Okay? And I could even, the other next highest yielding thing was international, I could push more that way as well. The other thing I might want to do is, you know, the reason Tesla's in here is I love Tesla, okay? I think it's undervalued, okay? So you know what? I'm going to take a $10,000 position, okay? And this is just telling you I didn't sell something to buy it. So non-allocated funds. It's going to have to sell something else to fund it, and it will automatically. But what I'm going to do here is, you know, that's a position size I can live with. I'm taking a little more diversifiable risk, but I'll put it on hold. That's the exact number I want. I could make it greater than or equal to. I can't make it less than or equal to, or it'll go to zero, as we saw before. But now I want to keep it and see what the effect is on my portfolio strategy by re-optimizing. Well, I only went down to 96.6. So that was a modest overweight, okay? You know why? Because Tesla's also in the total US stock market fund, okay? In proportion to its market value. So when, if I'm right, okay? And it goes up an extra 5% that I believe it will, or 20 or 50, whatever it is. 
a certain date. If you're disciplined, you put the date down that you expect the market to learn what you learn. And when it's fairly priced, you sell it. Knowing when to sell is really important. And then you'll be putting it back into um, the total stock market instead of taking it out of there. All right, we have a question from John. Okay, great. John, what's your question? Yeah, I'm just curious. So, like, I understand what you do with the money market fund, right? Yeah. But if we're, if we're considering this to be, say, like a taxable brokerage, why wouldn't you lean more towards ETFs that produce less capital gains, generally have lower expense ratios, um, so, for instance, like VTSAX, why wouldn't you replace that with like VTI? Well, that's in my benchmark. So, yeah, I would get to 100% if I did it. And I personally, like yourself, favor um, ETFs because they trade all day and you don't have the tax problem that you have in mutual funds. Okay. Because you like owning shares of stock instead of being a participant in a fund that has capital gains and losses. And, uh, get, and you may not have gotten the capital gain if you invested in December, right? That came for year end, uh, but you're going to pay it because you're in the fund before the end of the year and before distributions. So I absolutely agree with you. You should use ETFs whenever you can. I'm just doing an example of what John and Jane saw had and brought to the table. Okay. And I did mention there might be a reason. Okay. Um, and in a lot of 401k plans, um, you're restricted to what's in the plan. And many of them are just mutual funds and no ETFs. And the reason why I was bringing it up, I know people in an investment firm where they're very tight on what you can do personally. And in those cases, they don't let you uh, trade uh, ETFs as an example, because it be, could be acting differently than the client you're managing money for. But those are special cases. And here we get pretty close with the exception that you mentioned, but I would use, I use all ETFs for myself, no question. And I, what I was doing here, by the way, um, was to show you these are these accounts that I grabbed from some people, okay? And not one person, but multiple people, just to show you that these are what we call um, connected accounts. So once you set that up, and should I go back here? Yeah, I will, okay. If I go back to balance sheet, oh wait, before I do that, let me just show you one more thing. When you're done, if this is your solution and you like it, okay, you save it. I call it new revision. Oh, I did one earlier. Let me get rid of it. Okay. And you save it and you get all your trades that you need to do. Remember, Ripsaw doesn't trade for you. So you can go to the site at Vanguard and do your sales first and then your purchases to round out uh, all the odd lots round off some other things. You're gonna be buying a lot in whole shares. And, uh, so it won't be the fractions, but you'll get very close. You can use a personal checklist here. You can also reload it because um, it's now saved under load revision, okay? Now, let me get back here a second, okay? Because I didn't uh, do this detail. So these two accounts from Vanguard are what we call connected accounts. So you got there by picking Vanguard or if they don't appear on this uh, list, you can search and then it'll ask you for your uh, user ID and password. And once you're connected, every time you sign in, it reloads. So also if you do uh, some trades, okay, after saying I'm happy with these, the, the, the set of trades I want to implement, you go implement it at your institution. So we're not trading for you, but we have these suggestions that you created for yourself. We're not advisors, okay? You are doing this in your own best interest. 
So once you do that and you refresh up here, you should see your accounts reflect the trades that you made after they're closed. Okay. So you go back and forth. Now, the other area is if you keep, if it's not an account or you just don't trust, you know, that system and you want to do it by hand. And I think for your assignments, you've been doing these, okay? So here are different types of assets and liabilities that we have profiles for. And I created a bunch over here. And I, so far I've got Tesla in there. And in order to do any of these, I'll just open the home thing, okay? I filled this out already. Okay, but this is what you would do. Kind of property name you want to give it. What's its location? Uh, its address. And then um, you'll get information from, this is fake, okay? So, but here, uh, just so you know, I didn't want to put anybody's real address. But you click Zillow, you can get a valuation. Zillow's valuation here was a million three fifty. But I know a lot of people, and you should think about this too. Okay, Zillow says that's the selling price, but gee, if I've got to pay a 5% sales commission and something else and something else, I would reduce it. Or I'd say, you know, Zillow's got this wrong. My, uh, my sister in New York City has an apartment that says, hey, this, the market's terrible here now, and it's trading, clearly trading below. So she put in a number she feels comfortable with, a million two or something. Okay, so you have perfect, you have total flexibility. You have a source of information for valuation, but you can change it as you wish. And the purchase price was 1 million. So they've done pretty well. Now to do that issue of being able to take out the liabilities associated with the assets going to investment mode is the corresponding liability. So I put the home mortgage in it. But if you want to treat the mortgage as part of your bond portfolio, then you can not have a corresponding liability here and it will always maintain. Um, so that was that. Here's the home mortgage, which I showed you before. Uh, so you're just filling in really, if you're doing it manually. Now, a lot of companies that you might have gotten a mortgage from like Chase or something else, uh, your mortgage is also online. So it could be a connected account instead of filling it out manually. So we've got all the information about the mortgage from origination to yields and dates and all that. And it's always calculating, even though you put it in today, but it started three years ago, it'll tell you your remaining balance because you've been making those payments. And then you can choose a market rate. This is from Zillow also, some mortgage market rates for different types of fixed rates. And you're comparing that with 3% rate you got three years ago and say, wow, the value to me is I owe 507,000 because I got this extra investment spread I'm earning. Uh, to take away from it instead of the remaining balance of 751. Now, when this goes, let's say today's rate was 2% below the 3% you hold, then it's going to show you owe more because you're, the difference between the present value of the refinance rate, which is current, which is lower than what you're currently paying, is a cost. So the market value would be above the remaining principal balance. And so you can see that and make that decision of whether you wanna partially refinance, fully refinance, et cetera. But in this environment, with this mortgage, you wouldn't want to. I've got a few more examples, talking about an annuity, a pension. So John had a pension, 3,000 a month. He worked 20 years. And in government and is now on this $3,000 pension. What you want to know to value the pension is put in the birth date, go to the mortality tables, what's the expected remaining life and what's the treasury match duration okay, for that maturity structure and with that expected remaining life. 
and 3.9 comes out. And that's the discounting rate you're using on the cash flow of 3,000 a month to get the market value of 513,000. And here's an example. Maybe I'll use this quickly. Okay. Here's a private investment. Okay. Could be my own business if I was doing it. I'm now going to include it. Okay. It's a sorry, storage business. Okay. So I have a friend. Okay. That's running a business and lets me in. So I put in all the characteristics. It's US, it's small cap, less than a billion dollars. Real estate, blend, instead of value or growth, my assessment, price per share is $100. I bought 300 shares and the cost basis was 27.5. The market value is now 30,000. So I've made some money, market value of 30 in that. And it has a dividend yield of $10. So I'm gonna, save that and i could also do an option if you'd like but let's just do this it's simple so now on your balance sheet is abc self-storage thirty thousand dollar market value okay. how is that going to affect my optimization okay so let me click here and it takes me down to 87 percent now Okay, so maybe that's my loss of diversification from 99 down to 87. But there also may be characteristics of it that I can help offset. Why would I have this? Well, it's a small stock, right? Now I'm probably overweight small, small stocks, small cap. And I'm underweight large and mid cap. It's also blend. Okay, so now I'm overweight blend and I'm underweight value and growth. So maybe let's see what would happen if I added some large cap here. So MGV is large cap. And I'll choose it and add it. I can't add it to ABC self storage, but in my to brokerage and IRA, I can add a new investment. That didn't do a lot. Okay, actually 0.08% reduction. Let's see if mid cap helps a little. That's a larger number. And for mid cap, and notice it also, the screener said, you know, you're also underweight value. So why don't we do mid cap and value at once and see if that helps. Put it in these and re-optimize. Just a little better, not much. And the reason is, where am I stuck? Where are the reds? Okay, I forced for a tactical trade, I forced small cap to be overweight, okay? And also blend to be overweight. And there's no way I can completely offset it. That was my decision to say, I'm willing to give up some diversification relative to my benchmark to get this stock that I think is going to out earn anything else for the risk. And we find out later by measuring performance, whether you're right or not. So even though I tried those two, they're still here because I couldn't affect them. Now, in other cases, when I do this, like Tesla is a good example. When I have a big overweight in Tesla, what is that? It's a large cap growth stock, okay? But that's not why I think it's undervalued. I think it's overvalued because of the product and the management, okay? So what I wanna do is take away from large cap and add mid cap and small cap. And since that was a growth stock, okay? I wanna buy more mid cap value and large and, and small cap value. And this process would take me through that and get it there. So I could raise it from 87 to 90 or something, 95, whatever. But you're not gonna be 
you're making an active decision. Okay, and now sometimes it's not a tactical trade. It's because you have certain assets, like just imagine right now, if I did the pension, okay, what's the pension? It's a bond, it's a government pension. So it's AAA, government sector, US, all that stuff, okay? But notice it was like $450,000, $500,000 current value. But my bond position is I only want to be 23,000 in bonds, right? But I'm not going to say I don't want my pension. So I'm going to be off and the percentage will be a lot lower than 87. Maybe it'll be 60, okay? So I'm taking a bond position, I have it, okay? Now, in another market environment where the bond market was a nice percentage of your asset allocation, your tax, your excuse me, your benchmark, strategic asset allocation. And let's say it was, this is the, the, the pension is, let's say 500,000 and you wanted to do a million in bonds, but you wouldn't buy BND, which already has a lot of treasuries in it. What it would do is tell you to buy mortgages and corporates to get a balance close to BND, which is in your benchmark. You don't need more government. So it's unbundling the risk characteristics of the big indexes and saying, given that you have assets that aren't tradable or want to make a tactical trade or a tax decision, you need to work around it and to get the best portfolio strategy you can. And this allows you to do. I think I'm getting close to the end. Should I leave some question time? Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes left. So mm -hmm. if we have, uh, you know, we could pause here for some questions. Any Ripsaw specific questions? I know many of you have had questions for me in uh, recent weeks about how to do this or how to do that in Ripsaw. Um, it'd be a great opportunity to ask the creator of the software. Maybe not necessarily how do you do this or how do you do that, but why? All right. Well, we uh, Spencer has his hand raised, but before that, um, there was a, a question in the chat box from Lindsay on uh, what's next for the uh, the future roadmap of Ripsaw. What would you like to implement going forward that you can't do right now? I don't think there's anything we can't do. It's a bandwidth problem and also from a market uh, selling perspective. So I can tell you what's happening right now. <laughs> you saw the example I did for you for lifetime wealth planning based on just retirement date, right? Well, right now I just got some updates today on how we're doing of having a whole set of goals. Okay. So here's one I've been <laughs> dealing with with family members. So just as a good example, Oh, um, my daughter's getting married. The wedding, how much does it cost? Okay. Well, what should I, you know, say there's a limit or is it unlimited? And you can see if you put that in as a goal with an amount, or if you're saying you're gonna save for it for five years from now, you're also saying, gee, how's that gonna affect my retirement? You know, I'm 60 years old and my daughter's getting, 30 year old daughter's getting married, 35, whatever. And, um, you know, she wants a big wedding. And I only have this, I'm retiring in two years and I only have this left to spend. So people go through this process. And unfortunately it's very, uh, how shall I say, it's not pleasant. The process when you can make it pleasant by saying, here are the facts. Here's what I can do. Here's what we can do. College education, another good example. You save for it, right? And you've got a date and you put it over four years. That's another goal we could have. Okay. So now that wealth planning diagram you saw is now going to have five or six points in it where there'll be a drawdown. 
And once you have a drawdown, your whole future picture is changing. And it will depend at that time how your strategy is done. Did you end up at the bottom 5% or expected or upside potential happen? Uh, from that point on, your decision-making uh, will incorporate all of those. So that's what's going on right now. The next thing we're doing is what we call collaboration tools. So we want to hit the planner advisor market and give them a better set of tools for which the client will also own. So the client can then ask questions. You got me in this strategy. Here's my RIPSA setup. And why are you doing this or that? Look what it's doing to my diversification. Look what it's doing to this and that. And on the other hand, the, the advisor can use RIPSA to set up a strategy and then explain it. And they are both looking at the same picture, the same software and have access. Both have access, but you know, the user or the client has to give a level of access, which may be, you're not having my passwords and my user IDs for all my accounts, but you can see them okay, and make recommendations and we can see the results and go over it. So I want to bridge that information gap between advisors, planners, and their clients. And also, create a cost structure that's much lower so they can lower fees and still make as much or more money, but doing things in the best interest of the client. Yes, sounds exciting. Um, Spencer, you've had uh, your hand up for a minute. You have a question for Dr. Khan. Uh, yes, uh, Professor, I was just uh, wondering if there's ever a um, situation where you, if you're changing money in the account and someone's particular account that you would instead of putting it in a money market would you just have it in just pure cash would there be any kind of situation where we do that or is it always just going to go straight into a money market type of account well let me put it this way you're in control okay so if you have a savings or checking account fifty thousand dollars in it and you want to leave it there you can and it's only getting 0.1 percent but we're just trying to show you the opportunities and nowadays again te technology's changed a lot over the years I, I saw the credit cards come about let alone money market funds in the 70s so what i'm saying is uh, and that's caused a great disintermediation where money went from banks because of regulation Q to, finance, to money market funds, which was a new thing in the early 70s. And then they had to re re get rid of regulation Q, which was the government saying how much you could give depositors in percent so they could compete. But if you feel you need that safety net right there in your checking account or under your mattress, you can do it, but we're including it and showing you how you're deviating from what you could do. So it's up to you, but I just wanna show you the cost of those decisions. Oh, what I didn't go through, sorry, in the demo, I was gonna go through, we have, a, we have a section in revision mode where you can say, do I wanna buy a vacation home or do I wanna buy my first home? And it goes through the process of saying, um, you know, what's the price for the home you're interested in and how much you're willing to put down for a mortgage. And what's really important about this is where you get your down payment from, okay? And then once that money is out and into the bank, you have to re-optimize your portfolio. Maybe you sold some stock, maybe use cash, whatever it was, it has now moved you away from your benchmark strategy. You want to get back in. And sometimes it'll tell you a most effective way to do that. So it's got current mortgage rates and all that for you to say, do I want to put 5% down or 20? And you know the rate might be very different depending on those circumstances and yours and your cash flow. 
So that's why we had that negative yield when you had the mortgage in the net worth, because you could also put all your expenses, or it's also available in there. If you want to put in for your house, what are your annual expenses, maintenance, um, taxes, whatever you want. And it becomes part of your, a negative yield, basically. It's an outflow. So um, one of our masters in finance students who, who joined us live tonight, they're, gonna, they're required to watch this video tomorrow. Um, but uh, some of them joined us live this evening. And so Lu Zhang asked a question in the chat box about, um, this is a question that I've gotten from several masters in finance students, is how come um, when they click optimize in Ripsaw, it recommends selling all their stocks and adding certain index funds. And then the other part of her question is, does this mean that the recommendations from Ripsaw are similar to what a robo-advisor would do since they will typically put together a portfolio of index funds or ETFs? I would like to say absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the problem with a robo-strategy is it's a fixed strategy. It's a black box to you. We can't get all this information out of what they're doing, what they're investing in, et cetera. So you can't go ahead and say, oh, what's unique to me? They don't care about you know, this pension I have. And if they're putting 40% in bonds, and I already got the equivalent of another 30% in bonds, they're way overweighting my bond strategy without knowing it because they don't pay attention to the rest of my book. So when I say you've got to think about if you have things that look like a bond uh, or even if it's private, even this idea, which was a beautiful thing for people that either refinanced or bought a mortgage three years ago, that basically a mortgage is a short bond position. So what I showed you was when rates go up, you gain, which can offset the losses you have in straight bond purchases. Your net duration or exposure to interest rate risk is a whole lot lower. But if it's they're doing something that's equivalent to what you're doing, then elsewhere, then you're overweight. You rarely give all your money or all your assets and all your liabilities to one robo advisor. You're just giving them money for them to manage. You better have a lot of trust. And I just showed you all these strategies that have bonds in it were unnecessarily hurt bad this last year. Instead so of making an excuse, oh, interest rates went up, there was inflation. Well, Look at my compensation a year ago. Why was I in? So to part two of her question, um, why is Ripsaw recommending selling individual stock positions and putting them in index ETFs? Is that because it's a low cost, efficient way to um, you know, achieve a well-diversified portfolio? Well, just think about it. You set up a benchmark based on the total value weighted US stock market and international. Right? When you deviate from that, you're taking on diversifiable risk. Why would an algorithm tell you to do it unless you had a reason that that stock was going to outperform? Mm -hmm. right? I'm fine with that if you believe it. And your dealers, and you say, no, I'm going to keep the ten thousand dollar position in Tesla, and then you optimize around it and say, okay, well, Tesla was uh, is on. I believe it's undervalued. I think it's going to do better than the market thinks, and because it was or is a large cap growth stock, it means I need less large cap growth elsewhere. The optimization will do that and then tell you, and also if it's in there already, it will 
put more in mid cap and small cap value, okay? If it's not in there already, the assist tool will tell you to get it into your account so it can put money in. Why would you do an individual stock by definition if you have no special information? Mm -hmm. You would never do it. You would just use the large index funds. If you have special information, you know, I was on a lot of bank boards, I was in a lot of places where I did do tactical trades when philosophically I would say I'd never, I wouldn't do it, you know, but I'd only do it in those instances. Mm -hmm. And I would not listen to anybody on TV hyping. <laughs> All right, they well, they talk their book, which means they want you to follow them and bid up. Yeah. And then they get out and you're stuck when it goes. <laughs> Well, there's the there's the anti Jim Cramer strategy where you sell whatever Cramer says to buy and buy whatever Cramer says to sell. Yeah, but there's um, a lot of risk in that too. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather stay understanding the markets and when I have a comparative advantage, use it. And some of your comparative advantage is things like what your tax bracket is, things like I'm a long-term investor, I'm only 35 years old, okay? So I can take advantage of dislocations in the market. So when VIX does go to 72 again, okay? I know it's gonna be resolved, okay? But I'm also looking at the other elements of valuation to make sure this isn't a signal I can do well on. But if I'm a day trader, I'm not gonna use VIX that way because it could go higher tomorrow. And it will go higher, but by the time I, my horizon comes to pass, it will have gone through all its motions and settled to its fair value in a long-term strategy. So you have to look at your position in the marketplace and take advantage of that. No special information required. So when I mentioned bond managers, what do they do? All of their, what they outperform, it's because they underweight treasuries. Okay, so it's in their benchmark, their measured performance against their benchmark. It's almost 50% treasuries now, 26% corporates and the rest mortgages, pretty much. So what do they do? They say, I'm not gonna to go to zero treasuries when I underweight it, because if I'm wrong and the other sectors I pick do badly, I'm screwed. But I can move 10% out of treasuries. And if I'm a long-term investment strategy, I'll get the extra risk premium from mortgages and corporates. There's no special information involved. It's called sector rotation. Mm -hmm. And that's a regular strategy. And uh, there's an article in the Journal of Fixed Income I had published that shows that is like 99% of performance. It's just sector rotation, no special information. Not picking undervalued bonds and selling overvalued bonds. It's moving the macro dials. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're a long-term investor, so a pension plan, other things. And then you have the more active that do both. I'm going to take some macro changes and I'm also going to do some security selection. So I, I want to thank you for, uh, for joining us this evening for the past three hours. And uh, I hope this was beneficial to all of you uh, to hear directly from the author of our textbook and, uh, and, and founder and creator of Ripsaw, kind of what the uh, the philosophy behind it is, especially with respect to lifetime wealth planning and downside risk management, understand some of the subtleties of the products that we are talking about in this course and how they impact the uh, the wealth portfolio. So Stan, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.